Will you pray with me? God, there are so many ways we miss the mark. Sometimes we not only miss the mark, but we don't even remember what the goal is. So help us to stay focused on the love of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. In 1962, Marvel Comics introduced a new character. It was a great big green guy with red eyes called the Incredible Hulk. Do you remember him? Mild-mannered, tender-hearted Dr. Bruce Banner was trying to save someone's life when he somehow encounters some gamma-ray radiation, which unleashes this alter ego in him. Whenever his heart starts to pound, or his blood pressure goes up a little, or if he gets a little anxious or angry, all of a sudden this green monster comes out of him. He transforms into this huge hulk shredding his clothes, but somehow never splitting his pants, and then he wreaks havoc on all the bad guys. Hours later, Banner wakes up in some strange place where he's never been, can't remember how he got there, his clothing is hanging in tatters, and the only thing he's sure about is something really terrible happened, and it's his fault. So this whole series continues as Dr. Bruce Banner tries to find the antidote that the secret ingredient that will help him keep that Hulk under control because it's destroying his life. Now our writer in Proverbs chapter six today is trying to help us do the same thing, telling us about six or seven things that God hates that we have to keep under control, otherwise it might destroy our lives. Now we don't know a whole lot about the writer of this little section of Proverbs, but the New Interpreter's Bible calls him courageous because he assumes to know what God hates. Commentary suggests that just maybe this monk or priest observed many people's lives and saw the damage that could be done when people did not control themselves. And he figured if he hated those things, that God must hate them as well. The other thing we know about this little bit of scripture is that it seems to be in the wrong place. At first reading, you don't notice it, but commentaries call it an errant bit of text because it doesn't fit with the theme of chapters five, six, and seven in Proverbs. Now those chapters, if you read them, they are all about the strange woman. Y'all better watch out. Don't go to the home of the strange woman. Be satisfied with the wife of your youth. Don't listen to the call of this woman or your family, your life may be destroyed. And in the very center of those three chapters, we have this little pericope, this little bit of text that tells us what God hates. And strangely enough, adultery is not in there, and neither are the body parts that go along with adultery. But it has other body parts in it, right? The person who wrote that text starts with lying eyes as one of the six or seven things that God hates. Um, I'm sorry, haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that harm, heart that deceives feet that rush into evil. And then that lying tongue comes back again on the witness stand, slandering someone else in the community. And then finally, one who sows discord in families, one who causes trouble for others. Now what we find in this little bit of text is everything that God hates and nothing about love. And oddly enough, it never once uses the word sin. And I found that pretty fascinating because we've all heard of the seven deadly sins, right? If you don't remember what they are, Evelyn put them in the bulletin for you so that you can see them again. But I always thought those seven deadly sins came somehow from this little list in Proverbs because I had searched the whole Bible for those seven deadly sins and you cannot find them, not in a list. So I thought they must come from this section of scripture, but they do not. There doesn't seem to be a connection. Even though these are six or seven things God hates, 
There's no mention of sin, and there's no connection with that list that we are so familiar with. So where did that list come from? I did some digging this week, and I found out that an Egyptian Christian monk first put a list together of seven sins. And then 300 years later, Pope Gregory I took that list and revised it, made a couple of changes, came up with seven deadly sins, and published it. And since then, church fathers and theologians and particularly ministers who like some hellfire and brimstone in their, in their um, I don't even want to say any more of that. They misused this list of sins and keep us focused on the sins more than on the good news. So we miss the goal. Jesus came to share good news. But we stay focused on the sin. And that could be a problem. Now, what do you think sin is? If we had to define sin, we have ideas in our mind of what sin is, right? When I looked it up in the dictionary, it said that sins are immoral acts that break a divine law. Does that sound right? Immoral acts that break a divine law. But what I found in my study was that that is not what the New Testament writers had in mind when they used the word sin. Their definition is what's on the front of your bulletin today, missing the mark, missing the goal in life, things that distract us, that cause us to miss what God has for us. That is a much broader definition of sin than just an immoral act. So let's explore that a little bit more. I have two more definitions of sin for you this morning. I know you all want to know all about sin, right? <laughs> Got one, yeah. Now, a Zen teacher named Kenneth Leong said that sin is self-deception and also self-condemnation. Now, that's different. But don't we all have that critic, the inner critic, we call it, the one that says, Oh, that was a stupid thing you just said. Oh, I can't believe that you forgot to do that. You don't even deserve anything. You should have done this or that or the other thing. That's self-condemnation. And Leong says that's a sin because you don't talk to anybody else like that, but you talk to yourself that way. Then we have Father Richard Rohr, who has a wonderful definition of sin. And his is that sin is a blockade, imagine a roadblock, that we put in the road that impedes the flow of God's love and the force of life and stops us from reaching our full potential. Now, that's a lot different than telling a lie, right? Can you imagine a blockade and the road of life that you have put there and more than likely, you don't even know that you put it there. And it keeps you from being all that God calls you to be. Now, I want to share with you an example of sin from my own life, because I know you all want to know what the pastor does when she's not in church. But first, I have to talk to you about the book I'm reading, which is how I figured this out. I'm reading a book called The Road Back to You, and it's about the Enneagram. The author is uh, Suzanne Stabile and Ian Morgan Cron, and they talk about the seven deadly sins in this book on the Enneagram. Now, the Enneagram is an ancient personality typing system that has absolutely no scientific basis. So if you're one of those science people and you like data, you won't find any data in this Enneagram book. But what I find is that it is eerily correct. It has nine different numbers, nine kinds of personality types that most of us fit into. And along with each of those personality types, we have a strength and we have a shadow side. Much like Bruce Banner is a scientist with a rational mind, but his shadow side is the Hulk, all right? So imagine that for a moment, and I will tell you that I am a five on this Enneagram chart. 
And a five is a scholar or an investigator. I love to do research, to read articles, to search through the Bible and find connections and have those aha moments. And when I do, I feel like this is my fulfilled life because that's what I love to do. So I'm reading this book and it's going to tell me what my deadly sin is, my shadow side for fives. And it said, avarice. Avarice is greed. And I thought, well, that cannot be right. I'm the least greedy person I know. I give myself less so other people can have more. That doesn't make any sense at all. Then I read a little further and I found out that avarice also means stingy. And yeah, I can totally see stingy in me. Now, my family called it being frugal, right? My dad could fix anything with duct tape. Judy, you don't need a new bike tire. We'll just fix that with duct tape. And he did, and it worked for a while, right? But what it taught me was that I'm not worth the new bike tire. And I don't really need anything more. Whatever I got is good enough, even if it's broken. And I became very stingy, more to myself than to anyone else. And in Kron's book, he suggests that that is my deadly sin. So how does that play out? A few months ago, my husband Keith and I were talking about hiring a housekeeper. And I was totally opposed because, you know, you just don't pay somebody to do something you can do yourself, right? That's stingy and frugal. The truth was that every time I cleaned my house, I turned into the Incredible Hulk. My eyes would glow red and I'd have my vacuum cleaner and my Swiffer duster and I would tear the whole place apart and clean everything. And as I cleaned, I got madder and madder and madder until I was completely insane with rage and pity the poor fool who walked in with anything on his shoe because I was on them. And I stayed mad for days as the house got back to its original shape of being pretty dirty with four adults and two big dogs and dogs can't take off their shoes, right? So it never's gonna stay clean and the whole time I'm cleaning, I'm getting more and more angry. So I stopped cleaning. And my husband said, why don't we hire someone? And I said, no, because I'm stingy. We don't pay for that. We can do that ourselves. But I won't do it because it makes me mad. Do you see where this is going? So I've, it falls in my lap. Someone I know starts a cleaning business, a young woman who has a young family. So I called her and we hired her. Guess what happened? It was a win, win, win. We supported her in her new business. She comes twice a month and cleans the house. I don't get mad anymore. My husband's happy. Nobody yells, nobody shouts. There's no turmoil. There's no discord in the family, thanks to that writer in Proverbs who helped us see this. And the best thing of all is when she's cleaning, I can study. I can work on my message, I can walk the dogs, I can do things that feed my soul. And what was stopping me from doing all that? Stinginess. Now doesn't that widen our view of what sin looks like? Can you imagine a roadblock that is in front of you today that you put there, God never puts it there, Something that is in front of you that keeps the love of God and the energy of life from flowing to you and through you. Something that stops you from reaching your full potential. Now what do we do with this definition of sin now that we've got it? How do we look at our own lives differently? Well, first of all, I hope that you take that picture of the roadblock with you so that you can, can notice it when it pops up in your life. But second, what we need to do first is just notice our feelings. 
Not only has the church made us focus more on sin than on the good news, but it also has done us a disservice when we talk about our feelings. We were taught, I was taught, and I have even taught in Sunday school classes, don't trust your feelings, they change. Yes, they change, because they are communicating with you. They are telling you something that you are not conscious of. So we don't resist our feelings, we notice them. So what changed for me was first noticing how angry I was when I was cleaning the house. There's nothing in the house that should make me that crazy mad. But I noticed the anger. Then I noticed how stingy I was about paying someone else to come in. And the end result of overcoming that stinginess has been nothing but good. Good for my family, good for me, good for the woman who's starting her business. It's been wonderful. Twice a month my house is clean, so if you want to come see me, I will schedule it the day after she's been there, right? So first we notice. We notice how we are feeling, and we're careful to say, I am feeling angry, I am feeling ashamed, I am feeling afraid. Don't say, I am angry, I am afraid, I am ashamed. Because you are not your feelings. Your feelings are messengers. They're coming to tell you something. You are not those things. You are all children of God and you are beloved and you feel angry or you feel afraid or you feel ashamed. So make that distinction. Now some of you have asked me, why don't we always pray a prayer of confession in church like we did today? And I've pretty much made it a practice to not put it in there. And the reason is most of those prayers of confession say, I am a sinner, I am not worthy of God's grace, I am broken, I am sick. I am is the name of God. And whatever you say after I am is creative. So as your pastor, I cannot allow you to say, I am a sinner in church, because what is the goal of this life? To be more like Christ. If our goal is to be Christ-like, we cannot say, I am a sinner and I am Christ-like. Those two things don't go together. What we can say is, sometimes I miss the mark, but I am a child of God. You are not your worst moment. Whatever you have done or said or failed to do, the day that everything went wrong, that is not who you are. That is something maybe you said or did or failed to do that brought you all kinds of feelings that you feel, but that's not who you are. You are beloved children of God, and it is okay to act like that. You are worthy. You are so loved, more than you can ever imagine. And that is why I do not want you to say, I am broken, I am angry, I am ashamed. You feel those things, but that is not who you are. Let's just close here with those words. That's all I want you to take with you this week. To remember that even when we miss the mark, you are loved. No matter what, God loves you. God loves all of you. No matter what. Amen.